So I'm going to go ahead and get started. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Lily, and I am one of three co-presenters that we have for this workshop today. So we will be talking about frictionless data, data management, and openly reproducible science. And we're really excited to be able to present at CarpentryCon at home. You know, we were all pretty sad that CarpentryCon was canceled. I mean, it was very reasonable, of course, it was canceled, but it was so excited that this event is happening. So thank you to all of the CarpentryCon organizers. Really appreciate it. I am going to then hand it over to my co-presenters to introduce themselves. I know you just heard a little bit about us, but um, Oluso, do you want to say another word or two about yourself? <laughs> All right, thank you, Lily, so much. Uh, thank you, everyone else. Uh, again, just to mention that uh, we're here to share our experiences of uh, the Fishman's Data Tools, which are quite amazing tools, simple tools, that we can be able to use to make our data open and more reproducible. As I mentioned, my background is in bioinformatics and molecular biology. And uh, I'm also generally enthusiastic about data, uh, whether it is sharing, whether it is usability, <coughs> whether it is tools. And so I'm so very much excited about this training today which is also an aspect that uh, I love. I'm an instructor with the Carpentries. I've taught the genomics workshop once before COVID. And uh, also to mention that uh, I'm also in the task force that is had planned the Carpentry Con and the Carpentry Con at home. And uh, yeah, looking forward to having a good time with us all. Thank you very much. Hey folks, uh, it's me again, uh, Monica. Uh, yeah, we're really looking forward to giving this presentation, but also um, to be able to connect with the Carpentries. Um, so in addition to uh, working on open science at Environment and Climate Change Canada, um, I also uh, am on a leadership team of pre-review. So um, I know that there's been some connections between pre-review and the Carpentries. And so I'm really glad that I have an opportunity to connect uh, with this community um, as well. Great. And as I said, my name is Lily, and I am the Frictionless Data Product Manager at Open Knowledge Foundation. And I am currently based in Texas, so it's nice and early in the morning for me. So good morning to anyone else um, in the morning, and good afternoon to people in Europe and farther on. And I have had the pleasure of working with Monica and Nawuso over the last nine or ten months while they were part of the Frictionless Data Fellows Program. And um, it's, I'm really excited that we're able to do this workshop again together. So we're gonna split up the workshop and I'm gonna take you through the beginning and then Oluso will take you through the middle and the first hands-on portion. And then Monica will take you through the last hands-on portion. And please ask questions, you know, post questions in the etherpad um, or in the chat as well. All right, so the objectives of this workshop, we are going to be introducing frictionless data tools to you all. We're going to focus on our two browser tools or our web-based tools, the data package creator and good tables. And then we'll also be talking about the importance of good data practices, metadata, and also talking about open science as well. The expected outcomes for this workshop are that you will be able to create a data package using the web app and you'll be able to then create a schema file and use it to validate your data using the good tables web app. And you'll also be able to handle common errors in the frictionless data workflow. And if these words don't mean anything to you right now, that's okay. That's what we'll be talking about today and we will um, hopefully understand them by the end of the workshop. Okay, so first I'm going to give you a little brief overview of what frictionless data is. It's an open source project and it can be thought of as specifications for data and metadata interoperability. It's also a collection of open source software libraries, a range of best practices for data management, 
and importantly, it's platform agnostic, so it can be very interoperable. And what we're going to talk about today and the work that I focus on is asking how can researchers use frictionless data. So how can scientists or researchers best manage their data and use this open source tools to help them in their day to day life. We are going to be using a data set from one of our other fellows from the last cohort, Lily Zhao. And Lily is a PhD student and she studies coral reef biology, but she also studies the community members and the environment where they do this coral reef biology research. So the data set we're looking at today is from interviews that she did with residents and scientists in French Polynesia. You can see these lovely pictures of uh, the research area that they work in and um, working on these interview questions. So it, this data set, and here's the link to it, but it's also in the etherpad and it's hosted on Lily's GitHub and we'll go through it just a second. This data set is interviews. So it's interview data from 105 residents and 55 scientists. And the topics that are included in this data set are things like the life background, personal values, research priorities of the <clears throat> respondent. You can also read more about the data set here. And Lily wrote a blog describing her data and you can access that link from the slides. Okay, so now I'm gonna go through and show you how to get this data set really fast for when we're using it together later. All right, so you can either click on it from here or go through the link in the notes. And so this is on Lily Zhao's uh, GitHub repository. And if you're familiar with GitHub, that's great. If you aren't, don't worry, we aren't using it a lot and I'll show you exactly what to do. But you can see here, this is the data set. Um, it's fairly big, has a lot of column names. And it has things like role, group, age bracket, age range, etc. So when we use this data set, we are going to be using it in its raw form. So on GitHub, there's this button here, raw, that we will click on. And OUSO will show you this again in a minute in case you don't catch it. But I just want to show you that's how we are accessing the data. All right. So I'm going to get back into the slides. Okay. So we have a nice data set that we're going to use today, but what if you don't have a nice data set or what if you're looking for open research data, where can you find it? Um, I wanted to talk about this because when I was in grad school, this was not obvious to me. And so I have three different places you can look. And this is just a brief intro. There are more than this. So the first is repositories. And I broke it down into institutional repositories. These are things like if you're at a university, your university might have its own repository where you can upload your data or you can access other researchers' data. We have external repositories. These are um, repositories that might not be associated, say, with your university. Two examples of that are Zenodo and Dryad. And then we can also have domain specific repositories. And two examples of that are BicoDemo and OpenNeuro. So BicoDemo is oceanography data and OpenNeuro is neuroscience data. And there are a lot of other domain specific repositories where you can find open data. You can also find open data in published manuscripts. There are some journals that are really pushing the limits and very good about publishing open data in an easy to use way. So eLife and PLOS are two that I recommend looking at. For instance, in some articles for eLife, if the authors have given their data openly, then you can go to a figure on a manuscript and next to the figure it will say access or download the raw data associated with this figure. And that's super awesome. 
So that can be a really good way to get open data. Um, you can also get data from preprints, which are articles that have not yet gone through the peer review process. Another way is asking for it. So you can email authors if they don't have their research data open or you can't find it. And usually the authors are very willing to help you. Um, worst case scenario, they just won't get back to you. So I recommend emailing people. And then ask your librarians for help. If you're at a university, your librarians are trained to help you in this and very willing. So that is my final tip for finding open research data. Now I'm going to get into the introduction of the data package. So the data package is one of the core aspects of frictionless data. And this is what we will be focusing on for the first half of the workshop. So a data package, what is it? You can think of it like a container for your data and the information about your data that you need to understand the data. So I like to think of it like a shipping container that contains your data and its metadata and also its schema. So the data can be local, can be on your machine, or it can be in the cloud. And so that's what we'll be doing today using that data from GitHub. And it can be in any format we focus on tabular data, so like CSV files. Most of our tooling is made for using CSV files, but data package can contain any type of data. The next thing inside a data package is metadata, and metadata is data about the data. It's things like what's the license and who's the author of the data, and then we can also have a schema, and the schema describes the attributes about the data. It describes things like how many rows or columns there are, and then also like what data types should be inside a specific column. And so we will be learning today how to work with data in the cloud and then add additional metadata to it into the data package. And then we will also be generating a schema that we can use to validate our data. So why is it helpful to have a data package? It's data packages help you transport and reuse your data. It's pretty easy to publish a data package and you can give your data package to your lab mate or to your coworker or you know, if somebody wants to access your data, they can export it in the data package format easily. It also reduces friction and data workflows. And it's useful for reproducible research. One of the key parts of a data package is having that metadata that describes the data, and that allows other people to understand your data, and then they can reuse it. And we can also use it for validation. And the validation is what uh, Monica will be showing us later. All right, so we are about to get into the hands-on portion where we will be creating a data package. Frictionless Data has a few tools that can help us create data packages. The first is the web browser GUI tool, Data Package Creator. That's what we'll be working with today. We also have some more advanced ways of doing this, which are programmatic interfaces. And so I put links into the slides to these, but. Again, this is open source. You can find it all on our GitHub repositories. Um, so we have a client tool, we have Python library, R, and several other languages as well. And then the output of the data package creator tool is a data package.json file. So it's in JSON and it's useful to have it in JSON because it's very interoperable language. All right, so this is what Data Package Creator looks like. And this is what we're all going to be working with in just a second. And it has three sections we're gonna focus on, the left pane, the middle, and the right. And then I'm going to hand over the presentation to Owuso now to describe this and walk you through the, um, the first part. Also, I'm gonna try and grab my slides for a second. I'm going to stop sharing just for a second, but I'll come back. Uh, 
apologies. I'm trying to make sure I can see the, oh, there we go. Make sure I can see the chat. Okay. Oh, so I can share my screen again for you. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. There you go. Okay. Uh, this you're sharing the screen, or let me, I should share mine because I'm gonna. I have it up, but do you want to take over control? I don't see it up. Oh, am I not sharing? Sorry. Okay. Virtual workshop, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, thank you. Making your own data package. Uh, thank you, guys. Now, uh, as uh, Lily has been uh, doing a great job in describing what a data package is, is uh, now that you want to get to it practically and just get to be able to go through it to understand what does it entail? How can we be able to make a data package? And uh, what are some of the considerations that we need to take into place when we want to make a data package. And so uh, very quickly, I just want to again, realign some of the uh, parts of the tool that you're going to use to make the data package, which is called the data package creator, that the link is provided there. We'll go into it shortly. But as uh, Lily highlighted, uh, there are three main parts of it. The very, on the very left pane, we do have the metadata pane, which has a number of things. And you can imagine uh, how important metadata is to the possibility of research and uh, for the openness of research because one would be uh, wanting to understand what your data is about. One would be wanting to uh, interpret the data and one would be wanting to reuse the data. And without an explanation of what really your data is about, then these are things that become impossible to achieve rendering uh, a data redundant, useless, I may say. It's not redundant, useless. And so on the metadata side, uh, we're going to uh, see also the aspects of validating a package, which is also contained on that part. Also, we're going to see how you want to upload your data sets, which we'll call resources uh, into the tool. And then we're going to see how then you can have your data package in a shareable manner, download it from the data package creator tool so that you can be able now to, to share it with the uh, other folks. Lily, you want to roll over to the next slide? Uh, then the middle part, which is the resources pane. Uh, as I said before, resources are simply data sets that are in different uh, independent data sets. You could think of them as um, uh, a spreadsheet, then another spreadsheet, and so forth and so on. And then uh, under that place, you're going to look at, this is a place where you get now to uh, find your data, wherever it is, whether it is in, in the cloud, as we're going to see, or whether it is in your local computer and we're going to show you how to add each resource at a time into the data package to mean that the data package can accommodate several resources. And also we're going to highlight uh, some of the common errors that you may be able to come across when you're creating your data package. Uh, let's see the next slide. Really. Now then there is a uh, left uh, the rightmost side which is a uh, preview is called the preview pane or the json schema pane basically it's uh, the section that is going to automatically update a schema file that shows the structure of your data package so it's something that is real time as you manipulate the metadata pane the resource pane uh, the changes are real time and you can see them, uh, view them as you continue editing your, 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 your data package. And then of course, you're going to look at uh, 
some of the errors that you may encounter in the process. Next, Lily. Uh, this is uh, a section highlighting part of editor package file, uh, which uh, it's what the area which it's highlighting is called the schema. Uh, basically, the schema is uh, a section that describe the context of your data fields. It will tell us whether which, for instance, data format we are supposed to expect per column of your data set and uh, in which data formats uh, are those particular fields in. This schema is going to be important for us also in uh, the latter stages of validation that also will be shown by uh, Monica as we go along. Next lady. Uh, then how is your data package useful? Again, this is highlighted, but again, is to mention that the data package is quite a precise way of storing your data, or specifically for, for, for sharing, in the sense that you avoid to have unnecessary, in quotes, or junk details, but have a lean way of storing your data, so then it is easier and even cheaper to transport between media and uh, the internet, per se. And uh, also there is the aspect of reproducibility. With a data package, as we mentioned, it has the metadata pane that captures information about the data. And I must say the tool is very rich, as you will see in metadata capturing, having it at the levels of uh, the fields or the columns and also the general level of uh, the data package as a whole. And also you may be familiar with the FAIR principle, which is making sure that our data or our research is findable, is accessible, is interoperable and also reusable. Findable because you're going to have a unique identity for each resource in your data package. Accessible because we're going to see some of the licenses that you can attach to your data package that can then allow people to use them differently. Interoperable because you're going to see that the JSON schema is core to a data package file and the JSON schema is a, a very interoperable file format that is used across different uh, frameworks over the internet space or computing space. And then we're going to see reusability also attached to some of the rights that are attached to your data package and your data as a whole that can allow somebody to be able to reuse it. And also the metadata as a whole, being able to direct a user to be able to reuse your data. And then last but not least, there is data integrity validation which is also an, an aspect of this workshop. And so this is uh, the data package being able to point you to possible flaws or possible errors that might be in your data. And so with the validation, you're capable to identify where these errors may exist within your data set so that you can rectify them before you can be able to analyze them or share them. Thank you. Next slide, Lily. And now let's look at all these in a practical way. Uh, I might want to stop to share so that I will share my screen. Yeah. Okay, stop sharing. All right, let me just get that right. Mm -hmm. I doubt I'm having those fights yet, but I believe I should have them soon. Are you having problems? 
Yeah, you uh, are co-host also. You should right, be right, able right, to right. share. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. All right, I hope you guys can see my screen. Yes, we can. Great. Here we are. Now, uh, I'll just click on this link. And if you're there with me, you can also click the link. And when you click that link, as had been shown to us earlier on, this is the landing page where you get to arrive at. And uh, as you imagine, is that for us to be able to pass it, we have to have certain uh, things that uh, He goes, so it's a little frozen. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you for that, Lily. Now, starting from uh, this middle pane, you can see this is uh, title resources. And resources, as I mentioned, are the particular, the single data sets that you're going to be working with. For our case, we have a data set that we also uh, had shared earlier on. I hope everyone was able to access it. Please uh, give a shout out if you have any problems reaching to it. But uh, it's right here. I would opened it. Uh, let me see. All right, here it is, this CSV file, resident research. Now upon clicking on this CSV file, uh, then I get to the row. Remember that when you click on that, where we are directed to is the location of the file within GitHub. But then to be able to now get the actual data, which is the instance of the data, you have to click the row. So that with the row, it takes you to the row data and then you copy the link. You can just copy the link. And when you copy that link and come back to your data package creator, at this point written path, you come and paste the path to your .csv file and click load. Now something happened. I don't know whether you noticed it, but I will repeat just to be sure that you saw the difference. Uh, I'll quickly delete that resource and again, click on add resource. You can see that here we do have add field, nothing else, just add field. This is our first resource. And then under it down here, there is the add resource, which means you can add another file, tabular file. Now, what I did is I came here, I was adding my first file and pasted the link to the raw CSV file and loaded. I want us to see what happens over here. When you click load, then this second white box appears to the left and it tells you add all inferred fields, excuse me, which means the tool inferred the fields that are contained in your spreadsheet or whichever table data form that you have and so when you click add, then it brings the data on board so that you can now see, if you have a look at the organization here, each of these boxes represent a field, otherwise called a column. And if you look at this, the first one is document name, then role, group, age, and so forth and so on. In total, there were nine fields that you are looking at. And you can see as I scroll down to the very last part, there is this add field. 
at the very end of, of, of the fields that uh, my, our data uh, set add. And so this simply is to tell us that it is possible to still be able to add a new column to your data set within the data packaging tool itself. And when you click, uh, when you click this, then you can be able to add or even create from scratch a data, a data set from within this tool. Now, suppose that you had several of such spreadsheet files and you want to add them to make one single data package, then you just come here and again, click on add. You find whichever link your data is from and you paste it here. But how about if your data is contained within your PC? It's local. Then you simply click load and it will take you to your PC. And from here, you can be able to uh, navigate your file system and be able to uh, 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 pick your, your, your data file, wherever it is. And the same thing will happen. For our case, we only have one single CSV file. And so that is it. Now, upon adding this, you can see that up here, there is the resource name. Resource name is basically you can give that particular data resource or that particular file a name. Maybe you are looking at different aspects, which is the common case with our research cycle, that you often have table data in different uh, regards. And so perhaps this one was for, uh, this one was for, was a, a survey, let's say a survey for, for marine, marine life, let me say so. So you can give your resource a name from this point. And then there is the path that remains. And then uh, when you come to the specific fields, each of these fields, then you're again provided with an opportunity to be able to uh, be able to describe your fields more. Because at the moment, if I say document name, if this data is foreign to me and I haven't interacted with it, it will be difficult for me to comprehend what document I was talking about. But if I've interacted with the data, then I'm aware that when you talk about document name, I'm simply saying that the uh, questionnaires that we administered to the researchers where the data was captured, those are the documents. And so I can be able to describe this title, this column or field title more by adding information here. This you could say is the ratio near, uh, well, all right. Then you want to describe uh, the questionnaire, maybe how was it administered? Uh, maybe there are different ways of designing a questionnaire, what type of questionnaire it was. You can put all that at uh, this point. And then there is the data type. Automatically, the tool will infer what type of data is in every column or every field. But just to be sure that you're right and you're not having any errors in your data set, you want to confirm. And so if you find that you, the infra, inferencing was wrong, then you can be able to change that. There are a lot of, a lot of format, data, data formats that are given here, time, integer number, string, uh, GeoJSON, so you can pick whichever format your data is at that particular uh, column. Again, uh, there is a, a data format. Uh, it might be, again, there are options here, email, unique IDs, it might be binary, it might be a unique resource interface and uh, instance, sorry, and anything like that. So this allows us to, again, be able to provide important metadata that a person who is foreign to our data package, your data set, can be able to then work with our data without having to perhaps like uh, find us, do an email that might take a month to be responded to and such stuff. So that's why I, uh, I'm saying that uh, the data package is quite rich in metadata, which is very a core 
part of reproducibility of in data sharing. And so you go along like that, you can give descriptions through all, 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 all the fields that you have. Then uh, apart from that, apart from that, there's also this wheel here, the gear wheel, which is uh, familiar to most of us, the setting wheel. When you click also at this point, then it also enables you to again, give a description of the resource itself. Remember that the description that we've talked about here is a description of the column or the field. So you're describing each field accordingly in a manner that is comprehensible by uh, somebody foreign or external to your data. After that, you again go and make a description of the resource itself. Now the resource is the whole of this data file, which had uh, a number, of, a number of, 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 of fields. So again, here, you can be able to give a title for that particular resource. Then you can be able to choose what profile of data is it. Is it a table of data? Is it uh, what call a data resource? And again, you can also be able to uh, key in the format of the data and the encoding of the data. It might be UTF-8, whatever it is. And again, it provides you with the space to again give a description of uh, perhaps how the data in that particular resource was collected and uh, uh, such things as relating to, to, to that particular resource. So this is something that happens for every resource that you add to the data package creator so that then you are very clear on which resource is, uh, uh, which uh, metadata is associated with which resource. Now, uh, after I've shown you that, uh, then there is uh, the left pane. We'll go to the left pane, which is the metadata. We'll start from here. You can see there is upload, there's a, an icon button for upload, then there's validate, then there's download, but we'll talk about those later. When you come here now, we're having the metadata, but for the whole data package. We had metadata for fields or columns. We had metadata for resources, resources. And now we have metadata for the whole package. Surely with all that, I mean, if I were to include all that and then share with you my data, even if I don't have to be there, I'm sure will make something out of my data. Now, when you come to this metadata part for the data package, then you realize that there is um, compulsory fields. One of them is the name. And the name has to take a particular format, uh, which we will see. Now for this one, let me call it, uh, let me call it uh, CC Home Workshop uh, Freak Data, Frictionist Data. And then there is uh, the title of the data package Maybe you want to give it something more human readable and say uh, carpentry con home workshop. You can see now this is, uh, sorry, you can do work, workshop frictionless. Whatever name you want to give it, you can give it that name. But now this is more human friendly, readable than the one we gave it over here. So there is, then you go to the profile. The profile again, uh, the data package creator can take data in different profiles. Uh, it can be a data package itself. It can be that is shared with you or you picked uh, a data package from a repository. It can be tabular data, which is what you're working with. It can also be physical data, which is data associated with budgeting, finance, and stuff like that. For our case, this is a tabular data, and so we chose the profile, tabular data. And then again, here you can describe now the whole data package. You can give it whatever description you want to give it. Uh, then it provides you with the opportunity to do, uh, 
to insert a home page URL. This is basically uh, whatever you want to put there as your home page. Maybe you have the data deposited in some online repository and you want to make that be your home page. Maybe there was an article that resulted from that particular data. And so you want to have that, uh, the URL to that article or that work report, whatever it is here, you can capture that. And then there is also uh, the version. You may change your data package from time to time. Like for our case, for this one, we have one single resource but you might want to add another resource at a later time. You can version those ones in differently. Then name, uh, definitely you want to put a name uh, that's associated with the data package. And apart from that, then there is the licenses. The licenses are important to allow uh, reuse and uh, sharing of data and so the data package creator already has a pre-list of different licenses, Creative Commons and uh, Open Government license. Uh, whichever way you want to share your data, you can pick whichever license fits what you want your data to be like. CC0, uh, public, Creative Commons public, by attribution, you can attribute and share like, you can attribute non-commercial uh, open data, commons, uh, open data, public domain, dedication license, open database license, and whichever way. And if per chance your license preference is not here, maybe it is an Apache or it is a Mozilla license or GNU, whatever it is, you can always click other and come and key in the title of your license here. Then you can give it a link to your uh, licenses of, 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 of choice right here. And then lastly, but not least, you come down here to keywords. Uh, keywords, again, you can be able to highlight some of the keywords which are associated with your data. And you can key in a keyword one at a time. The first one might be an A, you add another one might be an B, a B, you add as much as, as much as, as many as you want, you can always add them over there. Um, well, now that takes, uh, that takes the part of uh, describing the metadata. And then I want to come back to, before we get back to this top part, I'd like us to look at the most right pane. It's quite small, it's hidden. And if you look right here, there are, three parentheses uh, inside a curly bracket. When you click here, it expands the view so that you get a preview. Now, if you look at this, this is what we call a, a descriptor file. It is the data package descriptor file so that everything that we do here in the resource pane and the metadata pane is reflected on this part. We could, for example, do this. Uh, let me see the name of the first field. The name of the first field is document underscore name. I can come here and change that name. If, for example, that's not what I wanted it to be, I would say that uh, it's a questionnaire name. Questionnaire name, you can see that has changed right here. Quiz name from document name to quiz name. If I were to change, for instance, the data format here, data type, sorry, data type, then you will see it has changed here also. And the format also, it changes. So the description, you can see I did give a description of some incomprehensible strings there that is captured there. So this is what your, 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 your data package file will look like at the end of it. This is what your data package file will look like. And also I want to highlight to us this schema, the schema key here. Now the data package 
descriptor file, which we are looking at right now, is based on the JSON schema, the JavaScript object notation. And the JavaScript object notation, as we said, is quite universally used across platforms. And uh, it should be something close to what you'd call a dictionary in Python, for those which are, who are familiar with Python, and their equivalents in, in, in other programming languages. So uh, it's sort of like a key. There is the key at this point, and then there is the value for it on the right of the column, or of the column, sorry, on the right of the column. And so the schema begins is actually the value of the schema key, the schema key. The value of it forms the schema file that Monica will elaborate more on. So after you're done modifying your data, whether you want to change column names, whether you want to uh, expand more on column names by giving them titles and description, whatever it is, and you've already inserted as much information as is possible and is uh, congruent to open sharing, then you come up here and you have to validate your data package. Remember, we are going to talk about validation later on, but that is validation at a different level. I also mentioned that the data package can be used for validation. That is validation at a different level. At this point, we are validating the data package. Because the data package has certain specifications, we want to check whether those specifications of the data package have been met. That's what this validation does. Now, I'd like to do something here so that we can appreciate why that validation is important. For instance, in the metadata pane, uh, the name of uh, the file, I have it as CC at home workshop, whatever. Let me say that I remove the underscore and replace it with the space. And then we validate this data package. You can see there comes an, a warning at the very top of the middle section telling us that the data package is invalid. Descriptor, validation error, missing, blah, 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 blah. But I want us to check interest in uh, the last bullet point. Descriptor validation error, string does not match pattern. So you see, there is a particular pattern that is expected for the name in the metadata pane. And you can see this is the pattern that I've highlighted over here. So when we consider that pattern, if you understand it, you can refer to, uh, to, to uh, pattern uh, searches and, uh, and pattern uh, queries with the query, pattern querying tools, grep and the likes, then you can understand which things should be included within that name. First, there should not be space uh, and it should be able to start with a lowercase letter, not an uppercase letter. And so our problem here is that we inserted a space here. So we'll do a, an underscore over there and then again validate to see whether we solve that problem. Okay. Uh, so, so Mike has this, caught it. It's the at sign in the name. At sign. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Yeah. You can see that also within this particular pattern, the art is not accounted for as one of the characters that should be within that name and that we need to remove. Let's see, letters A to Z, zero to nine, underscore dot. Okay, let's validate it and see now. Well, after that validation, the last bullet is gone. Now we are having uh, two more, uh, two more uh, bullets. Uh, the last one of the two says descriptor error, data doesn't match any schema from 
one of at resource one, the descriptor and at properties resource item one of in profile. Now, uh, when you look at that, there is, let me, let me just hide this schema a bit. Uh, resource one descriptor at properties resource items one of in. So did you add a second resource and not populate it for an example? I see, I think that the is resource two, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's delete that resource and then validate and see if uh, error number two will go away. And so it went together with error number one. So the fact that we did add a resource down here, but didn't populate it resulted to that error because the data package expect that each resource is populated accordingly. So that then you come and realize that now you have a data package is valid, which is an awesome place to be. Now, after ensuring that your data package is valid as ours is, uh, then we can be able to download download your data package. Now your data package is ready for downloading so that then you can now be able to share it or to archive it uh, as a data package. I'm more sure that uh, uh, if perhaps I lost you somewhere, please uh, just stop me anywhere. I might have been rushing at some point. So. I also get uh, Lillian and Monica handling handling the charts quite well. Yes, Lily. Yeah, thank you. Great, okay, so we can move on to questions about this um, and we'll give a few minutes for questions. I think we're running a little bit late, so we might just get Monica to go ahead and move on to the validation step as well. But if you have questions, please say them now or you can always type them in the group chat. Right, I think I'll stop sharing for now. Is that okay? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, thanks, Uso. I'm just gonna get loaded up here. Okay, everyone. So thanks, Uso, for that great um, overview of uh, the data package. And so in the data package, we were talking a lot about information about the data. Now we're gonna move into talking a little bit more about like the actual structure of your data and checking to see if what you think the structure of your data is truly what you think it is. And again, this is just to highlight the importance of, um, you know, this is not only useful for, your, for yourself. So like you may create a uh, tabular data file um, and you might um, accidentally add a, um, a blank cell. Or maybe you created um, a row that doesn't have a column um, associated with a particular entry. So you may yourself not even know that there might be some structural issues with your tabular data. And that's even more important when you're trying to share this data. There's nothing worse than getting other people's data that doesn't make a whole lot of sense or that has errors. So Uso went, all, went over how we can share information about the data so that you can interpret the data, particularly when you're sharing it. I'm going to go over how do we check to make sure that we're not embarrassed to share our tabular data. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, good tables. So um, as mentioned, there is um, um, a uh, continuous validation and a one-time validation for this because we just for the ease of this workshop we want to go over the uh, one-time web validation um, because that's probably the simplest uh, version of this tool to show you but as with the data package the, the uh, good tables also has a lot more that you can dig into um, and we'll be sharing those resources um, afterwards this is sort of to pique your interest 
Okay, so good. So um, why validate, as I mentioned, you know, you really want to look for errors, corruption, for that reproducibility to make sure that we're sharing uh, data that we're not embarrassed to share. Um, and also just for yourself, right, to see if um, before you go and jump into R or Python and try to, you know, plot your data, if you've got some invalid data or you've got some blank spaces that can really sort of mess up your the beginning of your workflow so this is a really good place to start both for yourself and to share it okay so if you go to good tables so if you go to this link um, here you will arrive at uh, good tables so this is sort of the graphical user web interface for it you're going to see uh, two places uh, where you can input information there is um, the uh, source here at the top here is where you put in your tabular data so at the top here it's going to look at your data and look for those sort of structural errors is it are there missing uh are there missing entries are there some blank rows do you are you missing a column um so it's going to look again for that structure here at the bottom um we're going to revisit the schema so if you've created a schema, um, I, you know, if you've gone through the data package process and you created a schema and you take that schema. Monica, I'm going to interrupt you. I think that yep. you're sharing the wrong screen. Oh. We see validating your tabular data slide. Oh, here we go. Okay, thank you. Here we go. And uh, do you want to go into, yeah, for Simone, thank you. Can you see it now? I think it's because it's jumping to the wrong one. Hold on. We can see your slides, but they're in. There we go. I think it should. Yes. Okay. You're good. There now. we go. Yeah. It's when it goes to presenter mode, it switches screens. Okay. So um, just to uh, go over this, we're going to go over this again, but um, we're at the sort of the good table files. The top here is the source. Uh, where it's the source, you're going to be putting in your um, tabular data information and down here in sort of the second um, place where you could add information is your schema. So uh, just to reiterate, um, Uso went over how we can get the schema from our data package. And the schema here is really important because it's basically telling, you're telling the computer, here is how I expect my data to look like and I want you to check if whether the data that I have meets the expectations of what I think it's supposed to look look like and so that is really you know a really great example of what validation is do does what I tell the computer match the expectations of what I think my data should look like and that's really an important step before you go and, and share your data or do any analysis again yourself Okay, so again, um, if we input it here, if we input, uh, there's two ways to input information at the source here at the top. This is going to check the structure of your tabular data. You can do it both by just uploading like your CSV file, or if you have your data in like a GitHub repository or somewhere online, you can add the source URL. So um, we're going to go through both of these steps. So I just sort of want to give you a little bit of an introduction before we, we I, I do a, a run through that you can follow along. And for the schema, um, again, you can, you can upload the schema uh, if you have the file itself. So if you've taken the schema from your data package creator from that sort of preview window, you can, you can just grab the data the schema itself and put it into a text file and save it with a JSON uh, extension. You can upload the file or again, if it's sitting on a GitHub repository, you can just give the source URL. So I'm just giving you a preview. It's going to be a lot clearer when we walk through it. Okay, so just to uh, reiterate what we can do with the web tool, you can upload uh, the tabular data either by a source link or through the file itself and you can also um, check to see whether or not your data is as you expect it to be um, by attaching the schema that you um, that you develop through your data package 
As I alluded to, there are different types of validations that you can do with this tool. You can do a one-time validation, which is sort of what we're gonna go through today in this exercise, but you can also build in continuous val validation with some programmatic tools. Um, you can follow up on that with the resources that we'll make available at the end of the session. Okay, so what's, uh, what can we do with good tables? Again, the validation errors, if you're just looking at the structure of your data using like your CSV file or your uh, source link, you can look for structural and content errors, again, like missing, missing uh, values or missing columns. Now the schema is gonna look at whether or not your data types match what's in your file. Okay, so how do, how do we do that now that we sort of understand the two main inputs on good tables? So if we go to good tables, uh, you can click this uh, link from the slides that we shared that are available on the etherpad. And let me just switch my screen now. Okay, so here we are on good tables. So again, um, there are two places where you can put information. Here at the top is where you would put your, either upload your CSV file or the URL to where your data is located and the schema part at the bottom. Let's just start with the source uh, file for your um, tabular data. So we're gonna go, once again, use um, uh, Lily's data. So if we go to her GitHub repository, um, it makes it a lot easier to use this tools when things are in GitHub or on some kind of web platform because we can use the source URL uh, rather than uploading the data itself. So here we need to have the file. So we're gonna use her data file, which is this resident researcher data. Um, the raw file looks a bit like this. So again, it's really just all of that information she gathered about um, the fishing communities. Uh, I'm gonna copy and paste the URL and I am going to then copy and paste it into the, um, this uh, entry field here and then hit validate to check it. It's gonna do some thinking, computing, and um, luckily we've got a valid table. So, so this table doesn't have any structural errors. So great, we're feeling great about this um, about this data set. You know, maybe we can uh, start doing some analysis on that. But I'm also curious to see if whether or not not only is there not any errors with this data in terms of structure, but again, whether or not the um, metadata information that I have on this tabular data matches what I think. It's supposed to look like. Are the fields that are numbers actually numbers? Um, and these, this is really going to save you a lot of headaches before you put it into whatever analysis tool that you are going to use, like R, um, you know, before it gives you errors um, in the event that, again, things are not, um, uh, your data is not saved in, you know, the right format, for example. Okay, so I'm gonna go and now grab the file that has the data schema for this uh, data set. So I'm gonna go into GitHub because um, Lily has made her uh, schema. I'm gonna grab, again, click it, click the link. I'm gonna grab the raw file. And then I'm gonna put it into the field here. So now it's going to check whether or not the data that I gave it matches the, the schema that I just inputted. So I'm going to hit validate. It's thinking, it's thinking, oh no, what happened? Well, if, uh, if you see and you scroll down here to the bottom, it's actually really neat in that it tells you what the error is. So here it's telling me that for this column, for age range, there's something wrong with the type or the format error. So if I go back to my schema here, and, I, and it looks like there's an issue with age range. 
So let's take a look at age range. Uh, yeah, so here I have it as a number, but if I look at my data here, it's actually not a number, it's a string. So it's telling me, hey, you think that this is a number, but it's actually a string, you need to fix that. So if I, you know, you can fix it either just directly in uh, whatever text editor that you have. So you can just change that um, from number to string if you actually know what the correct data type is, or you can actually do it in uh, GitHub as well. You can just edit from the raw file. So just for ease of use, we actually have the fixed one. We go back to the main page of the repository. Here is the schema with the right, uh, for age range, with the right type. Okay, so I'm gonna go to raw to grab that URL, go back to my good tables web interface, delete the old one, put in the right schema, and then hit validate again. Gonna think for a while, let's check in numbers, making sure things are aligned. And now I have a valid table. Now I feel confident that the data table that I have or the tabular data that I have matches the schema so that the schema is accurately representing what that uh, tabular data looks like. So let me just go back to this screen. Go. Go. Okay, so um, you can try it yourself at try.goodtables.io. Uh, feel free to use the data that we provided um, from one of our former fellows. And I think I'm gonna, since we're kind of running short on time, I'm gonna move into the question period and you can ask questions about um, either of the two segments and then we'll finish off uh, with some more information about how you can learn more about these tools. Thanks, Monica. If anybody has a question, feel free to say it out loud or you can write it in the chat or you can also write it in the, um, the etherpad. So we'll give people just another minute to do that. <laughs> Any, was somebody about uh, to speak? Uh, could I just ask you about the format here of the schema in good table? I see XML is not an option. Oh, why is that? Um, it's just a, a design decision that was made at the beginning. Okay, I, I'm an old, uh, <laughs> I've been around for a while, so, so I, I still use XML. A lot. Would it, so we're, we're always interested in hearing from the users and hearing if that's, you know, something that would be worth putting our time and effort into building out that functionality. Um, and if that would be a big blocker for you, that would be really interesting to hear. Uh, well, actually, there are ways to, to transform uh, JSON to XML quite handily, but uh, I mean, that's an extra step to do. Right, yeah. And I, I do think that uh, the validation options with uh, XML is still better than, because JSON, JSON schema is still only in its childhood, while uh, XML schemas and certainly Schematron be, being able to use that would be, is much more, um, I would say developed and uh, it's also an ISO standard. So, so it, it would be good to have. I'm gonna put a link in the chat here. If I can find it. Here is our main GitHub repo where we ask 
users, if they have a request, like a feature request, if they could write a user story in an issue for us so we can understand it, that would be a, a great way. If you feel up to doing that, I know that's asking you to do work, we would appreciate it. I'll try to. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, great. And looking back in the chat, it seems like we have a question from Jez. Can the tools record and validate file fixity information, e.g. checksums? Um, yes. Yes, and the link that I posted earlier to the Good Tables high documentation should include information about that. Um, Dan, curious if this would be published on our open site for discoverability. Yes. So right now, I don't think we're on our open site, but um, I think we're on CRAN. And we have a tool fund grantee that is working on making, updating the R code right now to make it more like tidyverse compliant. So um, the R code is being actively developed as well. Are there other questions for right now? You can put them in the chat as well. All right, if not, I will share my screen again. through this. All right, so we should have a little wrap up and say thank you all for coming and for working with us with technical difficulties. And uh, it's interesting trying to teach a workshop virtually. And so today what we talked about were brief introduction to what frictionless data is. And we looked at two of our browser tools. We looked at the data package creator for creating data packages. And we looked at good tables for doing a one-time validation using a schema. And we talked a little bit about why it's really important to have metadata to describe your data to make it more usable for yourself and for others. And about interoperability, how if you have packaged data, you can publish it places. Um, for instance, one of our previous collaborators published their data packages on Zenodo. And so that is another thing you can do. And then to end, I want to thank you all and thank the Carpentries. And again, I work for the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, we are one group of people that oversees the Frictionless Data Project. We do this with team members from Datopian, which is our sister organization. And so Datopian also has some additional tooling that we didn't have time to talk about today. And here are several links I want to leave you with. This is to our GitHub repository, where you can see all of our code. Again, everything we do is open source. We have a new community chat on Discord. And so if you have questions, please join the Discord chat and we will answer your questions there. We also have a YouTube channel where we have um, the last workshop and several other workshops are recorded there. And I'm actually not sure where the Carpentries is going to publish this workshop recording, but I'll figure it out and let people know. Um, so we have, as I mentioned, our documentation here in our guide, and this is being actively developed. So if you have feedback on our documentation, please let me know, or if you can't find something, please let me know. You can also follow us on Twitter. And I also want to thank the Sloan Foundation, which is the funding organization that has funded all of this work specifically focused on researchers. And I want to hand it back over to Monica and Uso to give them a final word as well. If you just want to say bye. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I, it's been such a, a pleasure to be part of um, the uh, Carpentries at Home and also the Frictionless Data Program as well. Um, yeah, and reach out if you have any questions. We've got a whole lot of resources and um, happy to give you more information. 
Yeah, thank you very much, folks, for having come. And uh, as uh, my predecessors have said, is that uh, uh, feel very free and uh, to contact any of us to reach out, uh, whichever way you can. If you have any questions, any further clarifications that you may need, anything clear, please you can go to help at zero course. So continue the conversation with some of us. Thank Great, thanks everyone. And my email is on the etherpad. You can always email me as well. All right, I hope everyone has a good rest of your morning or afternoon, wherever you are. And thank you, Carpe.